In this video, you can understand the waveforms of the jugular venous pulse and its explanation. For proper understanding of the contents explained, please view the videos on anatomy of JVP and clinical aspects of JVP before viewing this video. Before explaining the waveforms of the jugular venous pulse, let me just explain the activities of the atrium in a real-time sequence. Let me start from the phase of atrial contraction, also called the atrial kick, which is the last part of the atrial system. So let me start from that, which we can call it as the atrial contraction. So following atrial contraction, as I told, which is the later part of the atrial systole, there is no blood which is significantly present in the atrium. So this phase of atrial contraction is followed by a phase of atrial filling. So atrium gets filled progressively like 20%, 30%, 40%. Up to a point where the atrium is full, which you can call it as a peak pressure in the atrium. After the peak filling of the atrium is reached, the tricuspid valve opens and the atrium empties into the right atrium, sorry, right ventricle. So this is the sequence. So let me just put it over the waveforms and explain you. For all practical purposes, just remember that you have two positive deflection and two negative deflection in the jugular venous pulse. You can forget the C, which is a transmitted pulsation from the carotid artery. So the first activity which I told was the atrial contraction. So when the atrium contracts, since there is no proper valves between the right atrium and the continuation of the internal jugular vein, a positive deflection is appreciated in the jugular venous pulse. Mm -hmm. So after the atrium contracts, as I already told, the atrium gets filled from the internal jugular vein into the atrium. So during this phase, there will be a flow of blood from the jugular venous pulse into the right atrium. This produces the descent in the jugular venous pulse. As the atrium keeps on getting filled, you can see that the descent gradually goes up, something like an ascent. And when the pressure is maximum, we can call it as a peak pressure in the right atrium, it produces a smaller positive deflection compared to the A wave, which can be called as the V. So once this is reached, the tricuspid valve opens and emptying of the blood happens into the right ventricle. So this again causes a Y descent, but which is not as deep as the X descent. So if you see very carefully, the most prominent positive deflection will be the A and the most prominent negative deflection will be X in a healthy individual. This slide explains the causes of abnormal waveforms. Let's start from the A wave of the jugular venous pulse. As I told you, A is caused by the contraction of the atrium. So whenever there is a resistance to the contraction of the atrium, the A wave can be prominent. So which can naturally occur when there is an obstruction between the atrium and the right ventricle, which happens in tricuspid stenosis. And worse than what is seen in tricuspid stenosis, in hard block, atrium will contract against a completely closed tricuspid valve. 
So this can also produce a large A wave, which is often called the Cannon waves. So in tricuspid stenosis and in heart block, you either have a completely closed tricuspid valve or a partially to predominantly closed tricuspid valve causing a large A wave. Now, the next situation where you may have a large A wave when there is some amount of impedance in the right ventricle commonly due to right ventricular hypertrophy which may be or may not be due to a pulmonary hypertension. So, when there is an impedance to the flow of blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle also, you can have a large A wave. A wave is technically absent in atrial fibrillation, but it is more of a theoretical value because you can still diagnose atrial fibrillation without looking at the JVP. Now, when do you have a prominent X descent? Now, in constrictive pericarditis, pericarditis, what actually happens is that the heart is surrounded by a thick case. So, it is actually difficult for the blood to enter into the heart since the pressure given by the thick pericardium is high. So, the only point where the blood will rush rapidly into the right atrium is when the ventricle becomes small. You can see in the diagram that the X descent happens in the ventricular systole. So, when the ventricle size becomes smaller, the blood suddenly gushes from the internal jugular vein into the right atrium. So, that causes a prominent X descent in constrictive pericarditis. For V wave to be prominent, we already know that something should be added more to the right atrium in addition to the peak pressure which is already present. So, this is possible in tricuspid regurgitation because blood leaks back into the right atrium when the atrium is getting filled up or it is having already a peak pressure. So, when more blood comes into the atrium, when already there is a peak pressure in the atrium, you get a prominent V wave in tricuspid regurgitation. So, Y wave descent depends on the volume of blood which goes back into the ventricle because you know that Y wave is caused by a flow of blood from the right atrium into the right ventricle. So, in tricuspid regurgitation, there is more amount of blood which is coming into the right atrium every time. So, naturally, more amount of blood will go from the right atrium to the right ventricle, causing a prominent Y descent. So, though at an undergraduate level, picking up these waveforms are difficult, understanding the principles will go a long way for you to properly assess when you attempt to postgraduate or wish to learn in more in detail as an undergraduate itself.